Okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you on the closing uh, talk today, and I will try not to bore you too much. So, uh, in short, I'm Wojciech Mazur. I'm working in a Scala Fi compiler team at Virtus Lab, and my specialty is work on the Scala native, and that's where most of my uh, when I spend most of my time. But I also like try to help a bit to maintain the Scala Fi compiler. So, for example. Uh, I'm the one who maintains the co open community build. Uh, so even if you didn't know about, the, about this project, if you created any library, we already are testing it at the, against the latest version of the compiler. It's like 1400 uh, projects right now. And uh, yeah, and we also like cooperate with the LAMP MP MPFM team, uh, with Martin Delsky and his uh, projects. And uh, However, enough about me. Like, you came to the, today to hear about coroutines. And why did I pick this topic? So, uh, as I am maintaining the Scala native, and recently I was adding the support for system threads, uh, I really wanted to, at some point, have the virtual threads known from the Loom. So we can just reuse the same uh, common API that, and uh, then be able to easily cross-compile between uh, JVM and native. And one of the topics uh, when implementing virtual threads are coroutines in one of the, in one of the forums. Uh, however, when I started to research this topic, the word coroutine was really overloaded. Because, for example, you can have coroutines in Go, Go routines, and you have coroutines in Kotlin, but they are comp implemented in a completely different way. Uh, they work with completely uh, uh, another runtime semantics and or some uh, code transformations at the compile time. So today I really wanted to just explain you uh, the basic classification of the, the, of the coroutines, how they work, and last but not least, maybe just show you how we can, for example, implement them in Scala Native. So uh, let's begin. So let's start with some very basic stuff. What is a routine? So we as programmers have functions. And these functions basically are, have, are a box for instructions, which we can uh, invoke using the call instruction, op operation rather. And the code which we are, we are executing needs to contain its state. So for example, local variables, uh, where should it um, resume uh, computation when it returns from the function? And of course, the returner, which uh, suspends current execution of function and transfer and run hmm, uh, and moves control back to the caller. And uh, so when it comes to routines, the one type of them would be a subroutine, which is just a regular function that we normally use, which is basically uh, think that we start using the call, it runs until the very end, it returns some value, and we go on. There is no suspension, no keeping the state, no persistence uh, in any form. However, we have the other thing, the cooperative routines. Uh, what they have special is the ability to suspend their execution. Uh, so the coroutines are able to persist its current state as we are suspending them, keep it somewhere in a safe space, and later, uh, we can just resume computation just like we are just computing it, and there is no suspension at all. Uh, so they are a bit different from the standard, uh, standard routines, subroutines, because they actually don't, typically, uh, at least at a very low level, don't return value, value directly, but rather provide us with a uh, handler which we can use. This handler, uh, would allow us, for example, to extract some promised value that we, that we might yield from the coroutine, or possibly resume its execution, or in case of coroutines which might run, uh, run for infinite amount of time, time, so for example, generator of pi digits, we can just at some point destroy it and free the resources. Uh, but there is just not one type of coroutines. There are at least two. The first one, are stackless, other ones are stackful. Uh, what does it even mean? Let's start with the uh, stackless ones. What's special about them is the fact that 
and they don't really persist its uh, wall execution context. And that means that when we suspend, we suspend only to our direct caller or the resumer. And if we'd like to have some nested chain of uh, suspension, we would need to either in some way transform our code uh, or, and what's very important, a very function that we call in the between would also need to be also a status coroutine to allow us to actually uh, suspend and resume to some given point. Um, that, of course, introduces uh, some um, limitations and, for example, the problem on functions coloring, where um, all the functions that we need, that we call, needs to be, for example, either synchronous or asynchronous in terms of async await. And these type of coroutines are existing, for example, in Kotlin by default with its async await, but also are powering the Swift coroutines, Rust, C++ also, yeah, they also have coroutines since C++ 20. Uh, and what is also important that uh, to make them work, uh, we need to make some uh, code transformations. And uh, just a quick uh, show how that basically can be executed. We just start the coroutine, it would return to us some uh, handle on the suspension. We can then at some point on the same thread or maybe different one, resume its execution from the exactly same point where we have suspended that, continue and come back and so on and so on. Um, I told you recently about that they need to be transformed in some way. It is because uh, uh, the uh, code we are running uh, it's not that very simple to make it to just inject in one given location. It's just uh, sometimes it's easier to just maybe convert our code uh, to some uh, structure which would be easier to, uh, to resume at some point. So typically we'll have two types of uh, transformations of the code that we can find in the code system. The first is uh, stack machine based. Uh, so typically uh, our code will be transformed to some way of a state machine similarly to actors from ACCA, for example, uh, which uh, would define how the function should uh, behave when we resume it. And for example, in this case, we have, uh, we suspend our, our function two times, and let's imagine that we keep some uh, internal state describing to which logic we should uh, come, uh, come back uh, at next invocation. In the between, of course, there's a lot of machinery that actually saves and restores state uh, in some safe place, but we'll talk about it a bit later. And there is another way, which might for you be a bit more functional, probably, uh, because um, we can also introduce continuation passing style. That means that our coroutine typically returns some other callback or like a partial function, but not in term of scala partial function, but part of a function which can be resumed. And for example, I think this approach is, for example, used in the .e CPS async, which uh, introduces monadic, um, monadic coroutines, which are available in our uh, Scala runtimes. Um, but of course, we have the other ones. We have the stack for coroutines. What's special about, the, about them is the fact that we can actually call a coroutine and from the coroutine, we can execute other functions or different coroutines, which might at some point yield or suspend its execution. But this time we don't return back directly to the caller, but just to the place when we have like pay, put this type of boundary uh, informing where should we resume. And later, of course, we can again suspend our current uh, execution and continue uh, by just executing our code. And these type of uh, coroutines are also known as a fibers. Uh, and it's basically how the virtual threads work under the hood. Uh, they also, this is basically how Go coroutines are implemented as a form of stack for coroutines. So, the, so we no longer need to have this uh, function coloring that we had previously. Uh, but unfortunately, they do introduce a bit more of the overhead because now we need to know to which point we need to resume, not to the back uh, direct color. And we also might need to keep all the information, not, about, not only about our current coroutine that we, execute, uh, that we are executing, but, but about uh, the whole chain of them. So, uh, suspendable. Yeah, everything that I already told you was 
focus on suspension of the execution. But coroutines are frequently uh, combined with, for example, async await, the concurrent execution. And that's true, because uh, my opinion, coroutines are like the basic block, because as we have this uh, function which we can suspend at a given point, we can, for example, start uh, some asynchronous uh, I.O., for example, with some system calls. And at that point, we can, for example, s suspend execution and do something else, and at some point, maybe come back. Uh, but also, we can, for example, uh, mm, have some kind of runtime uh, management for the coroutines, some kind of scheduler, which would actually, uh, where we can basically just spawn a coroutine and it would uh, be managed by some runtime with maybe some additional help of some timers, some, uh, some system calls, and hopefully maybe some kind of these coroutines can, for example, shuttle themselves when they are suspending, or we can just specify the next one which we should, which we should call. For example, if you had just like uh, two functions, which one is, for example, producer and the other one is, is a consumer of, uh, of something. But now let's get, um, so now we have like this image of the classification, basically. Uh, how can we like different uh, difference between uh, different types of them? But uh, now let's take a look how they actually can be implemented. Uh, or rather, maybe let's take a look how they are executed. So uh, let's go back again to our standard subroutine, so regular func function. What's important that what's probably new about this, but let's make a quick reminder that when we uh, run our code, uh, we typically allocate some, uh, some chunk of memory for state of our function, which is uh, typically called an activation frame. This activation frame would contain all like, all like the local variables, some uh, state, for example, once should we resume the execution later, parameters, uh, etc. etc. And when we prepare to call another function, we do create another function frame, we fool it with some uh, context, so it knows, for example, again, when to resume ex uh, execution, and then we transfer co uh, control to this function. It can, of course, can continue calling other functions, etc., etc. And later, when we actually get to the return point for this function, because the lifespan of our standard subroutine is well known, it basically disappears as soon as we hit the return button, uh, it means that we can just simply deallocate de -allocate the allocation frame and uh, bring, move control uh, to the caller of this function. And this, of course, continues uh, in, the, in all the chain of execution. Uh, when it comes to, to coroutines, uh, at the very beginning, it's very the same. I mean, we just create a new uh, allocation frame um, and just uh, for example, run this, uh, this, this uh, suspendable function. However, uh, there's a one big very di difference at the point when we actually need to suspend the, its execution. Because we cannot just delocate, uh, uh, destroy allocation frame. Instead, we need to make sure that it will be persisted at some place. So, uh, where do we keep persistent data? Of course, on the heap. Uh, so, we, at this point, we can allocate a uh, coroutine frame, frame, which would uh, contain all the uh, state that is uh, required so we can safely resume this execution later. So this, for example, would contain um, the state of local variables, uh, maybe some state of registers, uh, maybe a promise uh, that, we have, uh, uh, that we have yielded upon the suspension. And, uh, of course, uh, some additional context that will be required later. And when we do that, when we have already persistent our state, we can simply deallocate our uh, frame on the stack and go back to the caller. At this point, because we have a handle that was returned by a call to coroutine, uh, we can, for example, access uh, the promise which would contain the value with which we, we would yield. So in this case, that will be the temp value uh, from the G function. And later, again, with the handle, we can just start resuming the execution. So we just, as with ordinary uh, subroutines, create a new activation frame and restore our snapshot of the state back to the coroutine. 
and continue executing. And at this point, it's basically from, far from the point of view of runtime, it looks like there was no suspension at all because everything is in place. And we can, of course, later just allocate the stuff, call other uh, uh, suspendable function, keep our state, uh, erase uh, uh, state on, on the stack, and move on. So uh, just to summarize, in stacked coroutines, we do only save the state of a current activation frame. Uh, and because of that, we need to somehow, uh, it is, in fact, is introducing this function coloring at some point. Uh, typically, this, as I said, the snapshot of the state would be of the heap, but some compilers can uh, go, behind, uh, go above this. Uh, so for example, if a compiler can guarantee that given uh, lifespan of given coroutine is well known, you can just put everything on the stack and it make everything uh, faster. Um, also, the, all the parts of the state of the um, coroutine that are not required for safe execution uh, after the re resumption of the function uh, can be just located on the stack. And this way, we don't need to waste uh, memory uh, out there, which would be a bit more expensive for us. And now the fibers. So um, as we know, fibers allow us to suspend at any point. In this case, let's assume that we just call some free anonymous functions uh, because we have like some iterators, we have this body of this function, which is not inlined. And we, uh, before we ex actually start to execute um, the fiber, we need to uh, create this fiber context that we would preserve uh, beforehand, because uh, otherwise we wouldn't be able to suspend, or rather get the handle to this fiber, because uh, our function would not really return it would only can store something in the promise, for example. So we would create a Faber context beforehand and start executing. At some point, at this very nested call, we actually get to the point when we want to suspend our execution. So how do we persist all this state? As I said earlier, the Staffel coroutines require us to save wall execution chain. So all these functions that we have here needs to be somehow persisted. So what do we do? The simplest way would be to just allocate some chunk of memory on the heap and copy the wall stack there. At this point, we can also like uh, modify the current execution context of our function. So for example, change the um, instruction pointer to point to the uh, resumption address of this function f that we had at the very beginning and move the uh, transfer the control of the execution to this uh, handler that we had previously. And then we can just continue executing. And when we at some point get to the point when we need to actu actually resume ex execution, we can uh, just copy all this data from the heap back on the, st on the stack and continue executing after, of course, uh, fixing up registers, etc. It's like a very big simplification, but, uh, the more, but it's basically the general concept of working with the fibers. Uh, and for, st for the fibers, um, typically there are like two ways of preparing the stack for allocation. So we can, for example, start our fiber with some dedicated stack that would be used for it for a, uh, for a long time, uh, which can, for example, be um, um, allocated with a uh, fixed, uh, at some fixed others, for example. Or we can just lazily copy it on demand when we actually just want to suspend and uh, maybe res resume it this uh, chunk of memory later. Uh, the, the word um, context switch that we use between for the changing of the execution of the fibers is the same as for the threads, because they do also switch the context. But in this case, we don't need to store that many information. Uh, we don't need to, for example, keep the thread locals because we will be still possibly ex executing on the same thread. So because of that, uh, um, fiber context switches are way faster than the threads. We're making them way cheaper, but they are still uh, more expensive than the stack stackless ones. Because in, uh, in their case, 
there is le way less memory that we need to preserve and resume at some point. And, but until we get, and we get to the next point, which is the coroutines a la Scala native. So I uh, actually made some experiments once and really wanted to implement them. And luckily, I found out that the, our backend that we use for, uh, for the Scala native, LLVM, uh, has already some, has some support for supporting coroutines. Unfortunately, only for the stackless ones, but it's still something. Uh, in fact, the LLV backend for the coroutines or the support for them is actually used in some languages, so you can just reuse it. And LLVM comes to us with uh, three kinds of coroutines that we can use. So they have these um, lowering, lowering phases or different kinds of them, uh, which can either be a switch resume, uh, which are basically co converting our code to a state machine. Uh, we have, can have, and these are used in the C++, for example. We can have return continuation, uh, which is used by the Swift, and it works in that way that, that it creates these continuations, uh, um, so the continuation passing style, uh, but it also requires uh, a more effort from the front end, so from us as a scholar native. And we have a special kind of these return continuations, which are designed for the asynchronous coroutines, uh, mm, and are quite, kind of similar to the returned continuations. However, unfortunately, uh, only first of them is very well documented, and I was not able to uh, um, to use the two to, to the return continuation based ones. So let's take a look at the at the first of them. So the ones uh, that are the, the simplest. In general, LLVM provides us with a set of tools or other functions that we can use, uh, and they have some special meaning when it comes to the LLVM backend. So, uh, for example, um, all these functions would, uh, for, can, for example, exist only at compile time just to, to provide some kind of information for the LLVM. And this, for example, can be a function which, for example, marks the uh, start of our coroutine body, which is the LLVM coro um, begin, right? And later we can just put, uh, put them in our code and LLVM would take care of transforming uh, this code into not one, mm. but uh, three different functions. So the first part at the very beginning would, be, would become our ramp function. Uh, that's, that's just a part of our, uh, of our code that would be responsible for allocating a new frame, a uh, new allocation frame. And uh, later when it's done, um, it would pass control to body of our, of our core team. Um, in the second part, so in this case, we can, for example, uh, pre-allocate the memory for our promise that we would use somewhere. Uh, we would create our uh, token, which would be like, which would uniquely identify the coroutine for the LLVM backend. And we can actually later allocate the actual allocation frame and to get the handle that we can later use for interaction with the, with the return coroutine. The second part, uh, the middle one, is the actual body of our function. Uh, in this specific place, we can actually put the suspensions of our code. Uh, however, there are some, uh, some strict rules that we need to follow. That, for example, we can only uh, head have the LLVM coro end function, which identifies end of coroutine, exactly once in our code. So because of that, uh, in this case, we have a boundary. So if we would spend or in any way would need to um, go outside of the uh, from a body of our coroutine, yeah, we would always end up in this um, in the same cleanup se section, which we have at the very bottom. Um, and here, in the last part, the cleanup, we actually uh, would uh, at some point free the allocated uh, allocation frame that is uh, contained, that is referenced by this return address, 
and actually would uh, inform that it, that we are out of coroutine body. Um, so uh, to make our um, DSL, let's say call it, uh, a more friendly for the user, we would define the body of our function as a so-called suspendable, which would be a context function taking a coroutine context as a parameter, which would allow us to, for example, preserve the handle to our suspendable function, but also would contain actual implementation of our suspension. What is very important is that you can see that there is a lot of inlines, both in here, on this snippet, in here as well. As I said earlier, uh, the stackless coroutines would not work well, or they would not work at all, with higher order functions or some nested blocks of, blocks of code. So we need to make sure that all of this body is at the same level, or at least a very usage of suspension is on the top level of the given coroutine. You can of course call normal uh, synchronous functions, which are not coroutines, they are subroutines, uh, but of course uh, we would not be able to suspend from them. Also when suspending, uh, when we for example can yield some value for our function, um, we would also try to save it to our promise and later for the handle would be able, able to access it. As you can see also we can use the other LVM intrinsic, LVM curl suspend, which actually is a both an invocation of function that starts the chain of moving control back to the color of our coroutine, and also is a point where we would come back uh, when we resume our execution. So it actually returns one of the three possible values, minus one, zero, and one. Zero is when you actually resume from the function, so we can make some cleanups in here, for example. Uh, we can, uh, the second case of the minus one only happens when you actually are suspending right now. Uh, typically it should not happen, but might be possible, for example, you could have uh, try catch blocks, which uh, might uh, break out our code a bit. And the one when we explicitly destroy our coroutine. And uh, based on that, we can then control our flow of, of execution. And one that we get in return is a suspended function, which is a wrapper for this raw LLVM handle. And based on, that, the base of this, we can uh, actually call the resume, destroy functions, uh, check if the, uh, the coroutine is done, so when it was suspended for the final time, or we can get, uh, get access to our promise via some, uh, some mapping function from the LLVM. And we can then, then just put it into like our ordinary code. Uh, it basically looks like some uh, normal function. However, we would iterate uh, here for the six times, uh, e and each, on each loop we would suspend twice, uh, once returning, for example, one, otherwise uh, other time uh, minus one. And in the place where we actually called this suspendable function, so we received, is a suspendable function, uh, we'll be able to, for example, iterate or consume its values as they are uh, generated on the go, one by one. So it's, uh, in this case, we basically have created a very simple producer and a, and a consumer, which would just produce, uh, produce uh, some uh, values, which we can um, use in some way. And if you'd like to actually play with, play with it, there's a QR code to a uh, fork of the scale native in which I have made some experiments, uh, but also I will post the uh, link to the presentation after, after my talk. And with that, we can go to the other type, again, of, this, of the coroutines, of the fibers, stack full coroutines or continuations. They come in so, in so many names. Um, so how do I actually uh, switch the context? Um, so, uh, one very important thing is to inform our CPU, our processing unit, which instructions we need to call next. So and for that we have, for example, some uh, registers uh, which inform what is the next instruction. But also we have maybe some values in the registers that, that might be required uh, and some other stuff. That's one thing. But we also do require to somehow preserve the stack. When working with stack, it's a bit easier because we can just take the 
current uh, top address of our stack, which is allocated. Maybe Texas take the address of the of its beginning and just copy it somewhere where we can uh, reuse it later. When it comes to modifying the registers, it's way harder, mostly because it's assembly, and we typically don't work with assembly. So, um, and what's worse with, uh, with that is that actually uh, the assembly is completely different on a different architecture or, or even on different operating system. Uh, for example, the, um, the amount of available registers might differ. So, uh, some clever people have long time ago introduced the two functions, for example, send jump and long jump, which are bundled into the standard C library, and which are quite simple. So we have the set jump, which again saves our current execution context, saves it in the jump buffer, and returns us some value. This value would tell us later uh, from which path we are coming to this single instruction. So uh, mm, the set jump would be both, again, saving uh, execution context and marking where would we continue our execution. And we transfer execution by referencing the saved uh, jumper buffer and by passing some non-zero value. Um, however, uh, even though with this approach, these methods are in the standard library of C, and they, for example, are widely used for different usages, for example, some implementations of exceptional handling, they are not uh, portable to some platforms. In that case, for example, WebAssembly, which doesn't really support them well, at least uh, currently. Uh, so they are quite good. They would be, however, for our purpose, when working with like classic architectures, uh, natively compiled, compiled file one, that should be good enough. And here's a very quick uh, snippet of usage of set jump and long jump. So here in our main method, we create a, um, the, we use the set jump to save our execution context and uh, then call the function foo. So as you can see, there is no uh, while loops, no jumps, uh, no anything. However, when we would execute the number foo, we'd print the current value that was passed, we'd use long jump to, uh, to call, uh, to come back to this exact point of the set jump with the value incremented by one. So finally, we thought we basically the same as we would have a while loop and then uh, print once uh, done after, on the fifth iteration. So when it comes to uh, implementing stack for routines, we can combine this, 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 this knowledge and let's make some prototype of uh, how it might be implemented. So let's define, for example, uh, some kind of continuation which would keep our state somewhere on the heap. Uh, let's define the boundary which would actually tell our runtime where should we, um, we should we use to easily mark the point to which we should uh, come back from the stack focus routine. And uh, let's implement suspend and resume. In this case, they are not taking any values. They are very simple. What's very important is the fact that in many places we have this send job which would um, uh, prepare our execution context, save it for later. And uh, in other places, for example, also all suspension, we would transfer uh, uh, control back to the uh, place where we have started. And for the one we actually suspend, we would, of course, uh, create a snapshot based, for example, on our current uh, um, top address of our stack uh, and, and, and preserve it for later. Uh, actually, I don't have a real implementation uh, for that, uh, even though it seems simple. However, they, there is uh, one guy who, who actually made it work, and there is also a working PR for this call native, which actually implements, um, uh, let's call it a boundary suspend uh, continuations. So you actually have this boundary, which is identified by boundary label, another context function. He makes some magic, it uses long jump, set jump, and uh, allows us to implement our stuff. The guy who made this is a, a PhD from the APFL, and uh, I hope I wouldn't butcher his name. And Gion Fan? Hope. Yeah. Yeah, good enough. Good. Uh, and based on that, we can actually 
create something that would be a prototype for virtual thread. So in this case, we create a standard runnable uh, that we just create somewhere. And let's assume that we are not in the top level, but in some very nested, con uh, co in some nested function. And this part of code is basically a thread yield, which would, uh, we would want to inform the runtime that we want to uh, co cooperatively suspend execution and move it to some other task. So we would actually create a boundary. This boundary uh, would actually uh, would contain the information about the, uh, this uh, continuation that we have. And you can just start any ordinary function in here. So a runnable uh, run in this case. And uh, at some point it would suspend. Uh, and at this point, for example, we can create an actual um, OS level thread and, and resume the execution on this different thread, the thread different from the main one. And it would actually run and we can, for example, build some kind of scheduler which would be used for cooperative work. And from me, as I said, it's not going to be very in-depth. Uh, however, for me, it's all, basically. And I just have a one quick reminder to take a part in the Scala survey, because it is really important that the both guys from the tooling, the compiler team, knows would know what do you actually need, what do you use, how can we help you, because it is really important, because we need somehow to get in touch with you, right? So uh, from me, it's, it's all, and I'm waking, waiting for your questions. <laughs>